Tim uh, Gardner and Council Member Maria for last month. Is that right? Um, I actually sent them to you and Council or uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, because uh, Council Member Maria was not present. So if you approve, then oh, that's uh, you right. and the that's Mayor right. Pro Tem are good to go. We're good to go. Okay. Uh, consent, uh, Bill, do you want to go ahead and start the sales tax chart? Uh, I will do that. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Levy, and I'm in the budget office in the finance department. Uh, going to walk through some sales tax numbers with you. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to try sharing my screen and hope this goes okay. All right, can you all see my screen? Yep. Excellent. So I'm going to, uh, again, just walk through oops, some sales tax numbers. Uh, what I have before you is 12 months of uh, growth rates for our sales tax collections. So looking at the very last month, of which I typically describe, we had growth in December 2022 of 1.5%. Um, and I do, I wanna spend just a moment on that because in a lot of ways that is misleadingly low growth. Um, I'm gonna switch over to the next slide to explain that. But if you look at this first number, if you can see where my cursor is in December, 2020, uh, the city earned about 17.4 million in sales tax. The following year, December 2021, we had $21 million worth of sales tax. So really high growth. And um, let me see, I can see people looking very closely at their screens. I'm gonna try yes. to this up. Yeah, thank uh, you. A little bit larger and see if I can get this to be a little more helpful. Oh. That was not so helpful. I get that to go away. I don't know if that's any better. Not a whole lot. I'll try one more time. If not, I'll just try to be very heavy on the numbers when I speak um, and do that in really round terms. Yeah, that's not doing what I want it to do. Um, sorry about that. So again, we went from 17 million, and I'll just keep this conceptual. We went from 17 million to 21 million a year ago, um, and then 21.3 million this December. So the growth rate was really low, but really what it reflects was the really strong December we had a year ago. Um, so exceptionally large growth a year ago, not large growth this year, because we were trying to grow over such a large number a year ago. Um, and, a, and a quick story about December 2021. In that month, we received the single largest sales tax payment I'm ever aware of um, from a single company in a single month. It was 1.8 million that came in from an IT company. Um, and the story there, and this, this may be good for this committee to know because this is gonna be some, a term I use a lot. Um, in the budget office, we often talk about variable sales tax payments. And a variable sales tax payment is typically comes from a company that we may see no sales tax returns from that company for a number of months. And then all of a sudden we see a huge payment from that company. Um, so we consider those one time, they're very much um, almost always business to business sales. So when you think about a $1.8 million sales tax receipt that we got from this IT company, they probably sold something like $50 million worth of IT products to generate that kind of uh, sales tax payment. So in this case, I have a suspicion it was related to a data center. I may be right, I may be wrong, um, but it's those types of things come up. And the real key to variable sales tax payments is they're very much one time in nature, unlike some of the other things we see. So we had a very large variable sales tax payment a year ago and it made it hard to grow. So that's when we go back to this chart and we see 1.5% growth in December. That was a really big piece of it. If we had taken that $1.8 million out of December 2021 numbers, um, that 1.5% growth would have actually been 11.1%. Um, so really, again, impacted by the large receipt we got a year ago, um, making it hard to grow over that amount. Um, 
The final thing I wanted to show you, and um, hopefully these numbers are at least a little bit bigger. Um, this is looking at sales tax for the entire calendar year 2022. Um, I go in and look at 200 roughly top taxpayers. And I'll be honest, some of the taxpayers are not individual. We do roll ups of things like eating and drinking places is, is one single line, but we go in and try to analyze um, in gen tax, the sales tax return and break it out by sector. Um, and the sectors are according to how the companies themselves um, describe themselves using a, a specific code in gen tax. Um, and so I broke this out by sector to look at how um, sales tax have come in. And then I, I ordered them by largest increase to smallest increase and thought that this was pretty interesting. And the other thing I tried to do is overlay these results with inflation. So you'll see at the very top, the, the sector that showed the largest growth was utilities. And lo and behold, uh, inflation, energy inflation was approximately 15.6%, reflecting large growth in both electricity prices and natural gas prices in particular. So sort of not surprising that in a sector that was experiencing large inflation would see large growth in sales tax collection. Um, similarly, auto dealers was the next highest and we had two new um, reasonably large taxpayers added that year. So I don't know that that reflects necessarily more sales per dealership per se, but we had a new Tesla dealer open up in Aurora and that added certainly to our results in 2022. Um, and then Carvana started paying sales taxes in very late 2021, which meant they had really large growth in 2022, you know, 12 months versus a couple of months worth of sales tax returns. Um, building materials and then eating and drinking places were the other two, oh, and other top taxpayers. And other top taxpayers, just to be clear, includes Amazon and eBay. So one of the things you're seeing there and why that I think is a faster growing sector in this chart is that online sales in general have have been booming over the longer term. Um, but also interesting when you look at this, that it's not consistent through the economy. We're not seeing every sector experiencing the same level of growth. I think another thing you're seeing is um, there was a trend in 2022 where consumers bought more services and less goods. And so you see you know, things like clothing stores and furniture stores, um, at least in terms of sales tax revenue and presumably their own revenue, not doing quite as well as other sectors of the economy. So. With that, if there are any questions, happy to answer them, but thought this was sort of an interesting way to look at our results from last year. Any questions, my colleagues? Just one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, just on the building materials, because um, I can't see the little numbers and I, I couldn't pull it up and e-scribe, but um, what was the dollar amount versus it's like utilities or auto dealers? So building materials, and I put this in the middle column and again, um, I may try to send you this because this was not an e-scribe, so my apologies, no. um, but I'm happy to, to get this to people if it's of interest. Um, building materials dealers generated 21.7 million last year, um, and their growth rate was 12% over the prior year in terms of sales tax collections. Okay. Great, thank you. Other questions? Councilmember Drinsky. Yeah, um, I know you said that we got for in 20, 21, we got the large IT payment. Um, is that separate from the marketplace facilitator payment that we got like 2020 and 21? It was, so I, I didn't talk about it, but the red on the chart represents marketplace facilitator. And that was, again, it's something different. So the IT payment really was, it came from a, not an online retailer, not a someone facilitating marketplace. It was a, IT companies selling IT hardware type of things. So really, I mean, if we were to back out, you know, the past, like from 2020, if we were to back out the marketplace facilitator payments and the large one-time IT payment, then our growth in the last year really actually would, would be a lot larger in comparison, right? If we were to back those things out and, and compare apples to apples. Um, in some ways it would, in other ways, so when you see the growth on this chart that I have up now in August, uh, September and November specifically, all double digit growth, they also had really large one-time payments in it. 
So even if you can, I know the numbers are hard to read and I apologize. Just the, those higher graphs up there, sorry, higher bars in the graph. Um, we had three out of, well, in the last four months, not counting December, we had double digit growth and three out of those four, we had really high one-time variable payments come in. So those to me were sort of artificially high, unlike December, which I'm describing as artificially low. Um, so it, it can work both ways. Sometimes it, it makes things appear stronger than they are. Other times it makes things seem weaker than they are. Okay, thank and, you. And Bill, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the marketplace facilitator now is built into our base. I mean, it's been over, and I think that's where the red stops is that at that point it was built into our base because we had uh, accounted for it from the year before when it was kind of a surprise payment. <laughs> um, and, and, and so after 12 months, now it's just, it's in there. So it's reflected in the growth. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, other questions of Bill? Okay, seeing none. Um, general business item 4A, looks like Nancy, you're up to talk about the GERP, the defined contribution yep. option. Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Wishmeyer, the city controller. And also on the call for this item is Joel Stewart of Milliman. And Milliman is the ones who prepared that actuary analysis that we'll be talking about. And I did want to let you know that listening to the discussion today are some GERP board members. So basically at some previous MNF meetings and also at a council meeting, council members had requested staff look at the financial feasibility of allowing employees to choose between the city's general employee retirement plan, GERP, that is a defined benefit plan, and a defined contribution or a DC plan option. So staff contracted with Milliman to prepare the actuary study of the projected costs and the funded status impact of allowing new employees that choice between GERP and a DC plan. And so the results of that study are in the packet. And I'm just going to highlight some of the assumptions and then the results. So assumptions included, first of all, new employees only would have that choice when hired of going into either GERP or that DC plan. Current employees, though, would stay within GERP. And the contribution percentages would be the same as GERP, so 7% employee contribution and 7% um, contribution for the city going into that DC plan. So those employees that choose the DC plan, basically 100% of their corresponding employer contributions would be going into the DC plan. Nothing would be going into GERP. And this is really key. There were two future enrollment assumptions. So either new employees would enroll at a rate of 90% into GERP and then 10% into the DC plan, or the other enrollment assumption was new employees would enroll at a rate of 70% into GERP and then 30% into the DC plan. So the results of the study, I'm just wanting to call attention to two charts, and I am gonna also try to share my screen. And are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So there were two charts that are of importance here um, that I want to talk about. So there's the funded percentage, and this is basically the ratio of the market value of assets to the plan liabilities, and that's chart three. And then there's chart four, which is the unfunded liability. So this is basically the plan, the total plan liabilities compared to the market value of the assets. And it just kind of looks to see, are we covering the liabilities with our assets? So in chart three, this is comparing GERP's funded percentage for the current program to both the DC enrollment um, assumption of 10% and then also that 30% DC enrollment assumption. And it also shows at various investment return assumptions. Um, the 7% is the assumed rate of return, but then we also show it at 6% and at 8%. But in all scenarios, the current program has a higher funded percentage than the DC enrollment assumptions for GERP. 
And that's basically that that blue line that you see there. That's the current program. And you can see that that blue line is always above the other two lines, the, the red and the purple line. Now, one thing at that 7% investment return assumption, the takeaway here is that although the funded status of the current program, the 10% DC assumption and the 30% DC assumption, they're all slowly increasing over time. But the effect of the decrease of GERP participation due to employees basically choosing that DC option instead would be to decrease the speed at which GERP's projected funded status returns to 10, uh, 100%. So I also want to, so this is, this is a graphical depiction of chart three, the, the funded percentage. I'm going to pop down to the end of this um, report. And here is that same chart three. This is the, um, the numbers, the, the data, and this is at the 10% assumption. And then there's also the data at the, um, the 30% assumption. So you can see here that, and we're kind of looking here at the, I'm gonna concentrate on that 7% investment return. Looking down at the bottom at, and this is actually um, the, I'm gonna actually make this a little bit smaller, but at year 29, um, at that 30% assumption that 30% of the um, employees would go into the DC plan rather than into GERP. GERP's funded percentage um, under the current program, we're actually overfunded. We're at 106% in year 29. But that 30% assumption, so only 70% now are going into GERP, we are, even after 30 years, we're still not at 100% funded. So that, that looks at funded percentages. Now I wanna go back up and I'm, we're gonna talk about the unfunded liability. So I'm running back up here to chart four. Now this chart, basically what we're doing here is looking at, um, I wanna just kind of concentrate right now on the 7% and 8% assumptions. They are showing that the unfunded liability is decreasing in all three of those scenarios, the current portion or the current program, the 10% DC assumption and the 30% DC assumption. But the unfunded liability decreases more quickly in the current program. And again, you can see that that line, that blue line, which is the current program, you can see that it's going down more quickly than the other two lines. So that's that's a good thing. But I'm also, again, this is a graphical depiction. I want to go to the data. So I'm going to go back down to the end of the report. And now I'm looking at that same data, um, the unfunded liability that was in chart four. Um, now I'm looking at it, um, the actual numbers. So we first have the DC assumption um, on this first slide. And then the next page is the 30%. Um, DC assumption. So the first one was the 10% and now this is the 30%. And I kind of liked looking at the 30% because it was just a little bit more dramatic. You could really see how the numbers were changing. So here, what we're looking at is if you look at that middle column, the 7% investment return scenario, after 29 years, the current program is showing actually a surplus. So we no longer have an unfunded liability. We actually have a net asset. So it's a surplus because it's in brackets. It's a surplus of $76.5 million. And then when you compare that to the 30% DC assumption, we're still at an unfunded liability, even after 30 years of $30 million. The unfunded liability is getting better, but we're still unfunded after 30 years with that DC assumption of 30% of going into DC. And then also on this chart, there's that third column in each investment reserve, reserve, um, return assumption, that third column is showing the funding, whether it's increasing or decreasing. And you can see that the funding, when you compare the current program to the DC um, plans, um, the 30% DC assumption, the funding is always decreasing. 
um, funding would only be increasing if you saw brackets in that third column. So the funding scenario basically gets worse with the DC option because basically you've got more employee participation in the DC plan. So more funding would be necessary to go into GERP in order to keep it on track with the current program. I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna let Joel, if, if Joel, you want to add anything and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, no, I think you got it all uh, right there, Nancy. I, I think the key there is a starting point. We did do our best to reflect uh, what happened to the plan during 2022. At the beginning of 2022, uh, the plan was actually in a surplus position. As you'll see in these scenarios, when a plan's in a surplus, it, it's less impacted uh, by the reduced contributions uh, into the plan. But during 2022, plan's assets returned about negative 10%. Uh, which put the plan at an underfunded position. I think it was about uh, 91%, Nancy, if I remember from that, yeah, that that's first uh, uh, page that you showed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if we go back up to the, the funded um, tables, you can see that the starting point in year one is that 90.6% in all cases, so that 91% funded status. Um, is, that, is that it? Or questions? Or, or any questions? Do you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure we do. So uh, go ahead, Councilmember Berge. Um, thank you for that. Um, fascinating. Um, so two things. Um, one, did you account for population growth of employees in that scenario? So, I mean, you because possibly you could have more people joining GERP, even though you have the percentage difference. It, it assumes a static population. So, it assumes that the active, the group of active folks uh, at the beginning of uh, the year, we, we base this on our most recent valuation, which as of January 2022, um, we, we assume that group remains stable and the overall uh, payroll is projected to grow at 3.25%. At and then my second question is, when you say after 29 years, uh, you know, we'd have the surplus versus the 30% uh, defined contribution, we would be unfunded 30 million. What does that, what's the implication of that for the city? Like, is there money to, in the 76 million, what do you do with that versus when you're in a deficit? It's once the money's in the plan, uh, I believe it's it would stay in the plan and, and go towards paying plan benefits and or uh, perhaps other changes to benefit policy, uh, things like de-risking, things of that nature. But so it, it, is, doesn't, it, stays. it doesn't we wouldn't increase um, any contributions or anything. No, no. And in fact, after the plan has hit 110 percent funded for three years in a row, uh, contributions to the GURP actually tear down. Uh, to five and a half percent. Uh, they're currently at the seven percent, seven percent for employee and and the city. Uh, they would they would phase down to five and a half percent if the plan were overfunded by uh, ten percent. Okay, so then that right. is a benefit to the employee. They pay less. And Correct. The city yeah, both the city and the employee. Yeah, right now under city code, the employee and the city pay the same amount. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have a couple. So what is the current, um, what is the an average annual rate of return? I know we're assuming seven and six and eight in these assumptions, but what is for the last, say, five or 10 years? I mean, is there a, a running average that we have that we use that, get, that tells us that? Because I remember at the state, they've reduced it from PARA, which is a much bigger fund, uh, because obviously it can make um, the numbers look more funded if you're assuming a higher rate of return. Um. So over the last, well, again, this doesn't, I don't have this data with uh, 2022 okay. uh, reflected, unfortunately, but um, as of the beginning of, of the year of 2022, our last full valuation uh, over the last 20 years, the return was about 6.6% and over 24 years, it was 7.2%. Uh, Got it. Okay. Um, and then, so this year probably be lower because of the just given uh the, right. the way that the markets um what they went through this past year so then um 
I guess, and, and it makes sense to me, right? This is always the challenge when you have a defined benefit plan and you try to convert it to a defined contribution is that essentially you have to have people paying into the system to keep it afloat, um, which is typically why, uh, you know, these types of pensions uh, over time will, will go bankrupt if you have, uh, you know, a number of bad years. Um, rate of return will just um, get, get crushed. And that, that's one of my concerns is that as we look forward and we continue on uh, this type of a, of a uh, defined benefit plan, if we have more years like 22, that unfunded liability grows. Um, and the more people we can start to pull out of that system and into a defined contribution plan, um, I think it'll be overall better for taxpayers, better for the city, because that, there won't be an unfunded liability because there won't in fact be a liability. It's just that this is their individual retirement plan. Um, whereas right now we create an unfunded liability by having a plan that's guaranteeing a set amount of payout um, and assuming that over time that rate of return will be there. What is the current unfunded liability? Uh, um, the estimated amount that begin Nancy, can you scroll down to that uh, sure. chart for? I think it was like 60. Yeah, 61 million is the estimated amount at the beginning of, of 2023. Okay. Okay. Um, so Nancy, are, um, is there any action item on this or was this just the, the study? Because I know there we're, we're, we have another conversation about the difference between the executive version versus the, the non-executive version of the GERT plan too. Um, I don't know if we had that discussion. I know that this, this question came up because we were talking about um, the, we, we had changed the code for the ERP plan and for yeah. GERP um, to actually reduce or to limit the, the choice of people going from one to the other. Um, but that, that had been settled and, and yeah. that code change had happened. Okay. Uh, and so then what, I think it just came up that, you know, do we want to have this DCI. choice for the general employees? Right, right. Okay. So um, is the, is there action item in terms of, do we have to decide, are we deciding whether or not we want to move forward with creating some sort of a defined contribution choice or not? Well, I think that, because there's there's some other considerations that need to be looked into um, city staff also we have to if this is something that we would do we need to look at funding and, and how it would affect GERP um, that decision though to start doing work and obviously creating a new plan that would take a number of years to do I think that needs to go to council and that's why I put this down as the item would go to study session to see if council then wanted to move forward one way or the other. Okay. Okay. I, I think it would be worthwhile. I do think it would be helpful to have um, the, obviously the 22 data and some different um, assumed rate of returns uh, just to give some different scenarios. Um, and, but yeah, I think it would be worthwhile to have um a broader conversation with council at a study session at some point about introducing this type of option. Okay. So we should do a little bit more work you, you're saying, and then come back to study session with, with a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I think it'd be helpful to have the, Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have the, the 22 data too. Okay. okay. Cause we've had some very good years in the market in prior to 22. Um, and that's the last bit of data we have. So it'd be helpful to see okay. when you have a little correction. All right. Any other questions on this one? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I have to leave for an interview, but I saw that. Go ahead. Enjoy your day. Okay. We'll Thanks. So much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Item 4B. Metropolitan districts. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. This is Tresserina Dancy. I'm a senior project manager in the Office of Development Assistance. And the next six items on the agenda actually are all mine. Um, I know we're in a little bit of a time crunch, and I'm happy to consolidate um, my yeah, presentations yeah. a little bit. So 4B1 and 4B2 um, are two new metro district proposals, service plans 
One is called Cielo Colorado, one is Harvest Mile. Um, Cielo would serve the future transport development and Harvest Mile would support the harvest development, um, which is currently in process. Both of these are strictly industrial slash, slash light industrial, so no residential proposed, and both are in compliance with our model service plan, and they are not asking for any um, edits or, or any red lines or anything of that nature. Um, and the ask is to move all of these items to the February 6th study session. So I'm happy to answer any specifics on either of those. Uh, any questions on? 4B or 4B2. Okay, we'll move those forward then. Um, and then the business improvement districts. Yes, uh, 4C1 and 4C2 are both board of directors appointments for Payne and Prairie um, bids, uh, number one and two. So this is a pretty standard ask that we get. Council has the ability to appoint members to the boards to basically just allow them to continue to function. Um, so there is no financial ask here. There is no um, burden on the city at all. We're simply appointing board members to those two bids. Okay. Any questions? Okay. We'll move those two forward. Okay. And then 4C3 and 4C4 are also for Painted Prairie. Um, both bids are asking for it, both an exclusion and inclusion of property for their bids. And essentially what that means is since the original approval of those bids, development plans have changed, property that was previously going to be residential is now going to be commercial. So they have to exclude any residential property from the boundaries of their bid and then in turn include that property into their bid. Any questions on that one or those two? Okay, that was quick and easy. I appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Uh, 4D, internal audit um, annual report. Michelle. Good afternoon, Michelle Crawford, Interim City Auditor. Today I'm going to give you an overview of our annual update for 2022. Share my screen. All right. And can we see the slides? Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Make sure they actually move. So I'm going to be giving an overview of our office, the engagements we've completed in 2022, those that are still active. I'm going to be going into a little bit of depth of what recommendations we still have outstanding as of year end and a review of any engagements that were completed in the fourth quarter. Just a quick reminder and overview of our office. We are a department of four where the police auditor is dedicated to police engagements and the other two auditors are dedicated to engagement citywide. We follow the professional standards of the Institute of Internal Auditors and we use a risk based approach. We report to this committee quarterly and we also present to this committee our annual audit plans for your affirmation. Engagements completed on the citywide side in 2022 include police property and evidence, visit Aurora, police narcotics change of command, citywide culture survey, Mayor and City Council expenses 2021 and 2022 quarters one, two, and three, and the Youth Violence Prevention Program expense review. On the police auditor side, Records Division Culture Survey was completed, Crisis Response Team, and Body Worn Camera Follow Up Part One. Currently active engagements is Mayor and City Council expenses Q4, IT Operational Assessment, and the Unified Metropolitan Forensic Crime Lab Firearm Evidence Process Review. I'm going to skip this slide. So I'm going to go into detail on the outstanding recommendations as of year end, including the audit plan year for the engagement, its title, how many recommendations are still outstanding, and any reasons we have for those delays. The first of which is the 2015 Payroll and Human Resources Audit. One of 17 recommendations remain outstanding. This is pending a technology solution. 2016 Physical Security Audit, six of 23 recommendations remain. Delays here are due to challenges in hiring a security manager. We do continue to monitor progress for this. The, for your awareness, the 2016 Core 4 Culture Impact recommendation for recognition will be tracked going forward as part of the 2022 Citywide Culture Study Survey recommendations. 2016 Aurora Fire Rescue, there is one recommendation of 23 pending, and that is waiting on the strategic planning process. 
For disaster preparedness, there's two engagements. The original 2016, there is one of 11 recommendations remaining. The 2018 follow-up has four of seven still outstanding. Office of Emergency Management does continue to make some progress and they are keeping us apprised of their efforts. 2017, Aurora Police Weapons Inventory. Two of 19 recommendations remain. This is again pending a technology solution. 2018 Fleet Management Review, one of 36 remains. We expect completion this quarter. 2018 Purchasing Operations Review, two of six remain, and purchasing is training new staff and is on schedule to transition to work day this year. 2019 Planning Culture Survey, two of 14 remain, and we expect completion this quarter. 2020 Body Worn Cameras, three of 11 remain. This is due to system implementation delays with Axon Performance. We do expect completion this quarter. 2020 Economic Development Rebates Tracking, seven of eight recommendations remain and these are due to various reasons. 2020 Versadex, two of six remains and implementation dates are in this quarter. 2021 Property Evidence, one of six remains and there's plans for the, that one in progress. 2021 Colorado Criminal Justice Records Act, it's eight of 15 remains. Records Culture Survey, 10 and 19 remain and we do meet with the records unit monthly to keep apprised of their progress. Crisis Response Team in 2021, six of 10 remains. 2022, Visit Aurora, three of six remain. Body Worn Camera Follow-Up, part one, six of six. Citywide Culture Survey, 15 of 15 remain. Lastly, I'm gonna just give a quick overview of engagements that were completed in the fourth quarter, and then I'll open up for questions. Mayor and City Council expenses, Q2 and Q3 was completed. The memos are in the backup. We're seeing minor compliance issues here. Majority of the issues we're seeing relate more to processes and training, and we're moving this to an annual review for our staff resources. Youth Violence Prevention Program. This was a request from Council Member Lawson. The scope was the program beginning through September 30th of 2022. There was 173 reported transactions for around $129,000. Reviewed 100% of any outliers, such as expenses over $1,000, and then selected a sample of anything remaining. We reviewed approximately $115,000 of those expenses. We identified one exception and we issued a memo to Housing and Community Services and Council Member Lawson regarding that. And finally, which you're both aware is the Police Body Worn Camera Follow-Up Part 1. This was presented to Public Safety back in November. The audit identified compliance in some areas, but not all. And APD is currently working on the Axon Performance Module to allow them to better monitor compliance. Went through that pretty quickly, but if you have any specific questions, um, please let me know. I have one. Yep, go ahead. Um, for the crime lab process review, when do you expect that one will be completed? I am meeting with the, the crime lab board tomorrow in executive session at their board meeting to review the draft report to go over that with them. My hope would be to get the responses from them tomorrow and um, to have that completed by the end of February to finish out the review process. Um, once that is completed, I'll be bringing that back to public safety um, once it's been finalized for a presentation. So you think that you'll have the review completed by the end of February and and be able to come back with recommendations by then, or will there need to be additional time for your recommendations? The report's drafted and the recommendations are made. And so I'm going to discuss those draft recommendations tomorrow with the board um, okay. at the crime lab um, to present it to them so they're aware and to give me their responses. So that's the last step in the process. So once that's done, then I can finalize and sign off on the report and then I'll be ready for um, publication. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle, one question I had is that in all of the um, areas where there's still outstanding recommendations going back, is there somebody that owns this? Like it, the, each piece of it, I mean, is it being tracked beside you? I mean, I'm happy you're doing it, um, but is there somebody who owns it within each department saying, yep, we're making progress? So we've assigned an owner in what we call it in our system, each department and a final approver. And so they get the notifications telling them you have a recommendation that's due, a recommendation that's overdue. Additionally, we've been trying to send the directors and deputy city managers lists on a quarterly basis to tell them these are the recommendations you still have outstanding. If we run into a situation where we don't see enough progress, we start to escalate that up the chain of up the kind of the hierarchy of the organization um, yeah. to, for those concerns. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure that there was somebody that was paying attention to that beside you. Um, 
I'm happy you're doing it, but somebody who's getting in those departments and making progress, hopefully. Anything else for Michelle? Okay. Um, next up is the draft work plan. Terry. Yes. So within your packet is the um, basically this the skeleton of the work plan for 2023. We've included some of the items that would normally come about for approval of the committee throughout the year. Some of our normal duties and and items that we bring forward relate to this committee serving also as the audit committee. So you'll see some of the standard items that we've included, but really it's up to the committee to determine what items they'd like to bring forward for the remainder of the year. And with that, I'd open it up to your thoughts and, and comments. Yeah, Terry, the, the only three that I know um, in the short term that I have that I'd like to come and, I, and they're drafted, one of them is um, a, a 360 review process for council appointees. I have something drafted and, um, and I'm going to try to put it on the, the next agenda. Um, and I, so we'll need HR to be involved with, with that. The other one is something obviously you're familiar with is the, uh, the old hire, um, uh, retirement boards, like the, what we're going to do or how we're going to move forward with that. And then the, the third one, um, we'll flush out a little bit at the winter workshop, but it's at the creation of a, a debt maintenance fund um, that would help us uh, with long term capital projects. So those are the three that I want to make sure that we're focused on two of them in the more short term. Um, but then the, the third being probably over the course of the next six months or so. We'll we'll duly note those and I do believe we have something as a placeholder for the February meeting uh, for the old hire places and fire as well as um, your 360 item. Good, great, thank you. His, by the way, has Dan sent over that the through the draft? I mean, has he sent? It should be going through. If not, I can ping him and let him know because I've I've approved the the most recent draft. I believe we've received um, some of the paperwork. I know. Um, Part of it, they were waiting for uh, some internal review. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else on on the um, work plan? No. Okay. All right. So it looks like our next meeting um, is February twenty eighth at one. Any issue with that? No. no. Okay. Well, then meeting adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. See ya.